second one of these videos, which should be the last of the males. I think we'll be able to finish this up in that amount of time, and then we'll switch over to females. As I said at the end of that last video, there's a lot going on here. One thing, one kind of overriding concept that I want you to recognize, right in here in these things called seminiferous tubules, this is where the sperm are produced. This is where spermatogenesis takes place. This is where the origin of the sperm occurs. And if you follow these tubes, these tubes are continuous all the way through the urethra out of the body via the penis. This is a continuous straight run. It's gonna be different when we get to females. So I mentioned that term, seminiferous tubules. This is where the sperm are literally born. This is where they're made. Um, as, a, as a little bit of information, you have about 250 meters of these per testicle, which males have two. That's about 500 meters. If you're not into the metric system, that's about 15, 1,500 feet, 1,700 feet. So we have these really tiny thread-like structures that are all producing sperm. That's their job, that's all they do. They're, they're very specialized. This is what they look like. And so that spermatogenesis would start out with your primary spermatocytes out here, and they would divide into secondary spermatocytes in here, which would then go to spermatids in here, which would then become spermatozoa right around this lumen, this opening. And you can see that swoosh of tails that are all coming out here. So this is one incredibly tiny cross section and you see how many spermatozoa you can see. Now take this out by 500 meters. That's what I mean by with males, it's very cheap and very easy for us to produce gametes. Now let me go back to this for a minute. If we follow these and we see how they start to come together into a thicker and thicker and thicker series of tubes, there are two important, I think, benchmarks that I want you to look for. Across the top of each one of the testes, is what's called the epididymis. Now, like I said, it's continuous with the seminiferous tubules. There's been no change, except spermatogenesis takes place here, and then they come up to the epididymis, the spermatozoa, that is, to kind of mature, to learn how to swim, to get their metabolism up and running so they're ready when they're called on for sexual reproduction. Then, there's this, this tube that we lose behind vasculature up here. And it's referred to as the ductus deferens, or I like the traditional name, the vas deferens, because that will allow us to really kind of talk about a form of birth control in just a few. So here is essentially, I think, the important component of this tube-like system. But there's one other type of tissue that I want to talk about. And it's all the space in between the seminiferous tubules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a, a cross-section, not this, but one that you would have seen on a, a slide had we had good access to scopes. Here's a cross section. You can see all these seminiferous tubules labeled as S and you can see these swirls of tails. But then there's an I over here, the area in between the seminiferous tubules. What those are referred to as are interstitial cells. So I think the two most important, let's forget nervous innervation and blood, the, the two most important components of each one of the testes, seminiferous tubules, sperm production, interstitial cells, 
which is testosterone production. It's, it's an endocrine component. It's producing hormones. That's essentially it with the testes. Pretty simple. But now we have to figure out where they're located. Okay, where in the body are the, uh, are the testes? The testes are not inside the body or the body cavity per se. The ovaries are going to be buried up here. The testes are essentially hanging outside of the body, not protected at all in what's referred to as the scrotum. The scrotum is kind of a, a slightly muscular, fleshy structure that really gives no protection, if I already mentioned that, to the testes. And you might think, well, why? Why, why is that the case? Here it is, probably one of the most important organs to being able to have babies. And for males, why is it placed outside the body? And it's temperature regulation. The enzymes in the testes that run spermatogenesis are really, really particular and sensitive to temperature. So if it happens to be really cold, these muscles are going to contract and push those testes right up against the body and hopefully warm them up to an optimal temperature. If it's really, really warm, well, they're going to relax and they're going to allow the testes to move down and away from the body. The downside to that is, as I've mentioned probably a couple times now, there is no protection for these, which is why if you're watching a football game and they're lining up for a kick, um, these individuals are not concerned about taking a soccer ball to the face. They're concerned about taking it to the testes. The, if you have any questions on that, email, email me. Now I mentioned, I, I wanted to refer to that tube as the vas deferens versus the ductus deferens, and here's why. There's a great method of birth control <clears throat> Considering these are essentially outside the body, this tube, the vas deferens, is very, very easy to get to. So what you do is you have your doctor make a slight incision, go in with a, a small hook, pull the vas deferens out, snip the vas deferens right there, and tuck them back in. Put a couple of stitches in and send you home with some pain meds. Uh, at this point, you have just had a vasectomy. Uh, they're not 100%. These can grow, grow back. Remember um, homeostasis. These want to repair themselves and they can. But aside from that, they're incredibly, incredibly effective means of birth control. Sperm are still produced, but there's no way to get out. Now we'll get We'll probably readdress this uh, once again, but let me jump over to the world of hormones in the last short amount of time that I've got before I want to cut this one off. There are two hormones that are really important with males when it comes to sexual reproduction, LH and FSH. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone and males don't even have follicles. <coughs> And then LH stands for luteinizing hormone. Now you might wonder why, what was the whole point of saying males don't have follicles? You're going to see FSH and LH in the female reproductive system as well. Remember, we were all set up to be able to go male or female. That's why males have nipples. Uh, we don't breastfeed because we don't give birth, but we still have nipples. Females and males, are both producing LH and FSH, but they're going to do very, very different things. Here's what happens with LH and FSH. When a male hits puberty, I mean, these things haven't been around, they, they haven't been produced. The anterior pituitary, that little bean that hangs off the bottom of the brain, it becomes active. And it's going to start to produce these and dump them into the circulatory system. FSH 
if you remember how these things work, they have a target. The target happens to be the interstitial cells of the testes. And LH has the target of the seminiferous tubules. So what happens when a male hits puberty, the seminiferous tubules become active and he produces sperm. And the interstitial cells become active and he produces testosterone which has a whole series of things that it does to the male body once it's produced. Um, changes in height, changes in, in muscle size, uh, changes in even the way the brain works. All of a sudden you have a libido, you have a sex drive. You never had it before. Sperm, yeah, now you can actually, um, I don't want to say parent, uh, but you can now cause a pregnancy. So once, I'm gonna make a little bit of a mess before we go to the next one. What happens is FSH and LH are flatlined like this, but once you hit puberty, they, they spike. And then through the rest of your life, as a male, they just slowly taper off, very slowly. So we don't have the, the undulations that we see in females when we get around to the hormone systems there as far as it goes with reproduction. So all that leaves us with is the rest of the anatomy. And the rest of the anatomy is going to look like this. So we'll talk about accessory organs, we'll look at the duct work, which we've already addressed, and then we'll wrap it up as far as males go in the next video. So this is where we'll pick it up.